Hello, this is Jamie from Stillmeyer Games, and today I'm really excited to do another one of these top 10 lists where I talk about the favorite games of someone who is very closely connected to Stillmeyer Games. This is one of my favorite people um, in, in terms of, of that connection because Josh Ward, the person whose list I'm sharing today, is 100% on his own impetus of volunteer and a supporter of Stillmeyer Games. Years ago, Josh started answering questions about our games on uh, mostly Facebook groups, but he also does it on Board Game Geek, but a really, really focused on, a big focus on the Facebook groups and all the questions that are asked in each of the Facebook groups for each of our games. And Josh just started answering the questions. He knows our games really well. I think he has a really good brain for remembering rules, and so he, he's very good at remembering those rules. He started uh, posting screenshots to show people the, the answers to those rules. He has probably answered thousands of questions at this point. And this is all on his own. Josh did this on his own. Josh also proofreads um, pretty much every product that we have uh, because he's, he's, he's a really good proofreader. And uh, I, it is just a pleasure to have someone who has just said, you know, I believe in Stillmeyer Games and I want to support them through my time and my, my knowledge of, of their games. And so I reached out to Josh as someone who is very closely connected to the company at this point. And I said, Josh, I'd, I'm doing these, these top 10 p videos about uh, top 10 favorite games from people who are very closely connected to some of our games. Would you like to share your list? And Josh did. He shared his list in alphabetical order. So um, I, I may end up by mistake calling these 1 through 10, but really there is no order other than alphabetical. These are Josh's current top 10 favorite games in no order other than alphabetical. His uh, first game on the list is A Feast for Odin. This is one that has showed up on a couple of the different uh, top 10 lists. I think Joe also had it on his list. Uh, Josh says, I like worker placement, so here's the entire chart of things you can do with one or more workers. And it really is kind of a worker placement player, especially uh, an advanced level worker placement gamers, um, a dream worker placement game because there are so many options on the board. Uh, and as Josh mentioned here, you have these different columns of action. So if you, if you have all of your workers at the beginning of, of your turn, you have a lot of different actions to choose from. But as you use up more and more workers, um, you have a column for one worker, column for two, column for three, column for four. And so if you only have three workers left, you might look to maximize them for a, a three worker action, or you might say, okay, I'm gonna do a couple one worker actions or a one worker and a two worker action. Um, and it's one of those games, actually one thing I really haven't mentioned about this game is that uh, there, there is blocking. Like when I take an action spot, there's only really one other way to get it and it's, that way is really limited. So usually when I take an action, no one else can take it that round. So there is blocking, but because there are so many other actions available, it, it never really feels like blocking. Like, yeah, there are times where you take something that I really want. That's gonna happen, that's gonna happen in worker placement. But because when you take that thing, there's also five other things that look pretty good to me. Um, it still feels pretty good. It doesn't feel like a game where you are constantly blocking other players from doing the things that they wanna do or where you're being blocked. Um, so yeah, A Feast for Odin, that's one of Josh's favorite, uh, top 10 favorite games. Second in alphabetical order is Azul Summer Pavilion. And this is one of the two games on the list that I actually own. Azul Summer Pavilion. This is my favorite Azul. Let's see what Josh has to say about it. He says, of all the Azul games, this is the one that I find the most thinky and I need to play, plan ahead further. I totally see that about Azul, about Summer Pavilion. The thing that I really love about this game is how rewarding it is during the game itself. Uh, and not just in terms of points. There are lots of little completion bonuses throughout the game. You can kind of say it's a little glossy here, but Lots of completion bonuses throughout the game that let you gain extra tiles. And that feels really good to me, that I can combo together a few things, put the pieces in the right place, and get something right away. Not just getting points, not just getting points at the end of the game, but get extra tiles right away. That feels really good. And I love that about Azul Summer Pavilion. Josh's, uh, one of Josh's games that I haven't played, one of uh, two games on his list that I haven't played, is Black Angel. Black Angel, he says, such a tight game of interconnected systems, there's never quite enough time or cards to do everything you want. I really need to try this game. Uh, I, I love the aesthetic of it. It has these brightly covered ship, colored ships that are on a, a mostly a dark board. Um, and I love that aesthetic that they chose for it. But I haven't actually gotten to play it yet, so I don't know much about it. I've heard it's a little bit like um, a Troy is in space. Troy? Um, Twa? Twa. That's how you say it. Twa. Twa in space. But, um, but I don't know. I haven't played it. Josh's next game on the list is one that I was just talking about with some friends the other day, and that is Forbidden Desert. Josh says, this is a fun little cooperative game. I had to have one forbidden game on the list, and this was my favorite of the three. 
Um, I have also, similar to Josh, I've played all three of them. And actually, similar to, uh, similar to Azul, as well, I do really love the original Azul. The Stained Glass of Sintra is my least favorite. And I love Summer Pavilion. But with Forbidden Desert, um, I have played Forbidden Island once. And I've played Forbidden whatever the last one is that came out. Really didn't enjoy that one all that much. But Forbidden Desert is one of my favorite cooperative games. Maybe even my... No, it's up there. Not quite per perhaps my favorite, but one of my favorite um, puzzly uh, cooperative games in which uh, it's a tile placement game, or not tile, it's a tile flipping game where you're moving around on tiles, trying to flip over and reveal what's on the other side because there's lots of stuff that you need to find on the on the bottom side of each tile. But as you, as you are taking turns, there's sand, sand tiles that are accumulating on the tiles on the, on the board that are impeding your progress and impeding your ability to actually flip over the tiles that you really need to get to. Um, it, it is a wonderful game. It's very easy. One of the, my favorite things is it's very easy to remember how to play this. I could return to it after not playing it for a full year, and I don't think I'd have to refer to the rules other than maybe for setup for the original diagram of the, uh, the sand tiles. Great game, Forbidden Desert. We're up to, okay, number not the number five, but the fifth game that I'll mention from Josh's list in alphabetical order again is Gloomhaven. Josh says, it's still set up on my table, just, just waiting for my group to feel comfortable playing in person again. Yeah, and I, I think Gloomhaven is now available digitally too, maybe still in beta. Um, so Josh may have been playing that uh, in beta version while he's waiting for, for friends to be able to play in person with him again. Um, but yeah, Gloomhaven, yeah, this is a game that I played, what, five or six times personally. It wasn't one that I, I wanted to return to time after time again uh, because uh, tactical combat just isn't really up to my alley. But the Euro mechanisms in it are so solid. I just actually watched Rado talk about it the other day. Rado runs through and talked about how um, there is... Uh, some shared information between players. Like you, you can see what's going on 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 the on the in the in the dungeon that you're running through, um, but you don't know the exact order in which each player's character is going to activate. And that uncertainty, as you plan ahead for each activation phase, uh, leads to some some really interesting things that happen. Uh, where you're kind of saying, okay, I'm I'm going to do this awesome thing, but I kind of need you to go slower than me so I can do that awesome thing and have it be impactful. Um, that type of of uh, slight uh, gap in communication is a great addition to this game. That's Gloomhaven. So now we're on the bottom five of Josh's list. I'm, I hope I'm not missing a game here. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, there we go, five more. Glory to Rome. This is the other one that I haven't played. I know that's a travesty for those of you who love Glory to Rome. Josh says he loves the black box edition of this game with really clean graphic design. The art, cards, and gameplay mixed to form a perfect game. That's high praise. I've heard great things about this game from many people, and I really need to give it a try. Um, but I, I've heard it has multi-use cards, some very powerful combos that you can set off, or and a par powerful engines that you can get running. I just need to play it. That's glory to Rome. The next game on Josh's list is Photosynthesis. He says, a good abstract puzzle game with a wonderful theme on top. And this is a little bit of a deceptive game, too. I, you've probably seen this on tables where uh, it's, a, it's a game with a nice verticality to it because you have a number of uh, trees, tree tiles that, that are, that are three-dimensional that are around the board. And um, it looks like a very pleasant game, but it's actually a very harsh game. Uh, players punish each other throughout the game because they're, they're blocking each other from the sun. Um, with the way that they place their trees. But, so there's a ton of player interaction in what is otherwise, uh, a, well, I would say it's, it's somewhat abstract. Josh uses the, the term abstract, but the, 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 the presentation and the way the theme is presented throughout the game um, isn't all that abstract to me. But, uh, but there's, just, it, there, there's a lot of interaction in this game. So if you like interaction with other players and you're looking for a theme that might appeal to, to players that isn't you know, fantasy and wizards and, and science fiction, Photosynthesis is a great game to try. The other game on Josh's list that I own is QE. Josh says, I bid $27 billion for putting this game on the list. That's a great way to put it. This is a game where you can write down any number. It's an auction game where you can write down any number on, uh, on these little tiles that, you're, that you're, um, you're bidding to gain these tiles. And uh, it just leads to some, some I, I love that hook. That is, that is an incredible hook in an auction game that you can bid any amount. With the catch being that if you have spent the most money at the end of the game, you can't win. Uh, you, 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 just, you, you are out. And so even if Josh spends $27 billion to get one of these tiles and he would have the most points um, at the end of the game, if he does have the most points, he can't win the game because he spent way more than the other players. But I love how the amount that players spend really dictates the flow of the game. You can start out 
bidding really low in the hundreds. Everybody, everybody's bidding like $99, $50. And then suddenly someone says, you know, what happens if I bid $100,000? And that changes everything. Suddenly players are building a million dollars or maybe they're really hedging their bets and trying to wait for that time where they can get something for a lot cheaper so they, they, uh, they, they don't have to be at risk for, um, for spending the most money. It is an awesome, fun, and silly fun. There's a lot of silly fun moments that come out of this game. That's QE on Josh's list. We're getting to the end of the list here with an S and a T. You can guess what's coming next. Splendor is up next. So Josh has a, a, some nice, uh, a nice mix here of some really heavy games um, and some, some much lighter games. I, I'm guessing Josh has, has brought some people into the hobby with these lighter games. Splendor, he says, when I need to convince a non-gamer to play something, this is my go-to. Plus good solid chips and the components, the, the ch poker chips in this game are really, really nice. Splendor is actually one of my favorite engine building games. It's a very abstract engine building game, but I love the idea of uh, the, the type of engine that you're building in Splendor is that you are making things cheaper. As you are acquiring cards, they give you an ongoing resource that, uh, that means that you don't need to spend chips on similar cards from then on. So. That feels really good to me. Whenever There are moments in Splendor where you get a card for free because you have built your engine in such a way that the things that you have create a, a free item for you to gain. And that feels really good to me. I love that style of engine building. That's Splendor. The number 10, or not number 10, the last game on Josh's list in alphabetical order is Terraforming Mars. We're back to a heavier game now. Um, and we've seen this show up on a lot of, uh, of the lists that I've shared recently. Terraforming Mars, he says, Tableau Management, since I put, couldn't put Wingspan on the list. That's right, yeah, Josh didn't want to put any Stillmeyer games on this list. He does enjoy many of the games that Stillmeyer Games publishes, otherwise he wouldn't be so involved with our company. But, um, but I, I totally see why he relates Terraforming Mars to Wingspan. They are both games with a lot of unique cards, with a great theme mixed in with them. The, the theme of the cards is reflected by the mechanisms and vice versa. And, uh, and they're both engine building games and that every... Everything you do makes you feel more and more powerful throughout the game in Terraforming Mars, same as in Wingspan. Um, and Terraforming, Terraforming Mars has some awesome th uh, thematic elements, too, about how you are trying to bring up the temperature to a certain level, how you're trying to get the oxygen level to a certain amount and a certain number of oceans on the, on the map itself. I love those, especially in a competitive game, I love that you are all trying to... Uh, collaboratively terraform Mars so the game can end and, and someone can win. You win together in that way, even though only one player actually wins the game. Uh, but yeah, Terraforming Mars is the last game on Josh's list. I'd love to hear your thoughts on these games, if any of these games are also on your top 10 favorite game list, or if there are any of these that you want to try, or if you want to share anything with me about Black Angel and Glory to Rome, since I haven't played either of those games. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below about those or any of the games on this list. Thanks. And thank you to Josh for, for putting together this list.